the general mood inside the Jacob Javits Center right now is one of anxiety and excitement. Everyone feels it that tonight might be a very historic night for Hillary Clinton. We're about five hours into Trump's election night party in Midtown Manhattan. People didn't come into this party expecting a lot. This room is a lot smaller than Hillary Clinton's room. The crowd's a lot smaller than Hillary Clinton's crowd. But as the hours have gone on and the results have started to come in, there's been a real change in atmosphere here, a real sense that maybe something could happen. Democracy kind of uh, failed itself a little bit last night. I, I think that an incredibly unqualified, demagoguing, racist, misogynistic person was elected president. The polls were wrong, the liberal media was wrong, the silent majority won. I fell asleep with a little bit of hope, and when I woke up, it was kind of a nightmare. There was a lot of people that didn't get out and vote. That's my opinion, but I voted. <laughs> hey, upheaval. <laughs> the largest uh, upheaval in American politics since probably the election of Andrew Jackson. I was definitely kind of expecting a win for women. Um, I think there's a lot of subconscious sexism that went into the election. Um, a lot of unspoken racism as well. Minorities and women and the LGBT community kind of lost a voice last night and um, the what, the white supremacy vote sort of won out. The people finally got what they wanted. For years and years, politicians have been telling us what they think we want to hear. And Donald Trump finally came out and he spoke with the people have been thinking of for years. You really want to know what I think happened? I think it sucked. I never want her in there. I think she's cooked. Put that on TV, I don't care. <laughs> people were you know, voting for their careers, they were voting for their safety, they were voting for their income, and that's what they went out and voiced. It was just racism, the white people power. Trump was underestimated. There's, there's no question about it. I mean, the, the media, uh, you know, the so-called uh, know-it-alls that uh, are in that business every day, they just underestimated him, and uh, he just came out and did a number on him. I think the election process worked this time. It was very interesting, very close, and I loved it. Tell you the truth, I'm glad the bitch lost. There's a lot of people that talk a lot of stuff about politics and they won't go out and vote because they don't believe that their vote counts. I think a big swing in Wisconsin was Hillary never coming here. I think she just assumed that Wisconsin was going to go her way and that didn't work out too well for her. 
here we are, and Donald Trump is our president. So apparently those votes counted. No one was that excited about Hillary. She was a pragmatic choice that wasn't that exciting. I vote, personally voted for Hillary, but I seen that a lot of people wanted something new. They didn't want the old political structure. I think people just uh, upset with the status quo, just want change, just want any change. I don't necessarily know that people were in love with Donald Trump, but they were just tired of what was currently happening. We need somebody who is going to try and change it, not just keep like, for example, Obamacare. Not everybody believes in that. Last night was a referendum on education and class in our country. So Clinton would have gotten in there, ammunition would have disappeared or the prices would have gone up. And I just feel, you know, guns would have disappeared. I mean, I, I was honestly scared for the country. The red states kind of got manipulated by, by Trump and it's, it's sad. At the end of the day, he seemed the most truthful. Uh, we hope that he comes through on his promises. And there was a lot of distrust with Hillary. Just plain and simple. They were so disgusted by the fact that Hillary Clinton was even able to be a candidate. I don't know. I, I mean, I, you can tell I'm like still dejected. It, it doesn't seem real. It seems like a crazy dream. People have hidden their true feelings about others, whether it be females or other people of color or people with disabilities. We've not been allowed to say what we think about them. And now with a person like the newly elected President Donald Trump, you can say whatever you want. What I think happens next is going to be interesting. The things that he had said during his campaign are still going to leave a bad taste in my mouth for, for years to come. Maybe he can stop being an entertainer and start being an actual leader um, with positivity, uh, who isn't um, hateful and who isn't promoting bullying or fear. And I hope that he can step up and be just a better person for the country. I disdained all the kind of obstructionist tactics that Republicans took in uh, the Congress in the last couple of years of Obama's presidency, but I now feel like I want almost Democrats to do the same, which I feel like is a horrible opinion. I have no idea. I really don't. <laughs> Unity. You, you have to definitely tie the two parties together. That's if they can do that. There's no roadmap to where this country's headed right now. Um, I'm incredibly scared. I, my friends are incredibly scared. My family is incredibly scared. Um, I don't know. Hopefully Donald Trump will be able to repeal Obamacare and make some changes in Common Core and will put some money back in our wallet. I'm scared, but it's not as much that I'm, I'm nervous for myself. I'm nervous for my Muslim friends, for my gay friends, for, uh, for women who felt like they were going to take a major step forward and now have to backpedal. He becomes president, makes all these claims, and hopefully Congress will shoot most of them down, especially that stupid wall. I'm hoping, uh, you know, maybe get some uh, infrastructure projects going, like a wall built. That could create some jobs. What happens now, we cross our fingers and uh, hope for the best. Well, I just see a lot of division. I see a lot of hate, and I see a lot of things going backwards. We have to move forward. We had a, uh, eight years with the Democrats. Let's see what the Republicans are doing now. They have the House, they have the Senate, and they have the presidency. So let's watch and see. We've survived before. America's had bad times, and people think these are bad times, but hey, this is the best country in the world. Today at around noon, 30 hours after voting began, Hillary Clinton conceded the election to Donald Trump in a speech in Manhattan, in what may have been her final bow from politics. They were some of her most powerful moments on the campaign stage this year. Last night, I congratulated Donald Trump and offered to work with him on behalf of our country. I hope that he will be a successful president for all Americans. This is not the outcome we wanted or we worked so hard for, and I'm sorry that we did not win this election for the values we share and the vision we hold for our country. This is painful, and it will be for a long time. 
But I want you to remember this. Our campaign was never about one person or even one election. It was about the country we love and about building an America that's hopeful, inclusive, and big-hearted. I know we have still not shattered that highest and hardest glass ceiling, but someday someone will, and hopefully sooner than we might think right now. And to all the little girls who are watching this, never doubt that you are valuable and powerful and deserving of every chance and opportunity in the world to pursue and achieve your own dreams. <laughs> Finally, I count my blessings every single day that I am an American. And I still believe as deeply as I ever have that if we stand together and work together with respect for our differences, strength in our convictions, and love for this nation, our best days are still ahead of us. Donald Trump wasn't the only winner last night. Republicans up and down the ballot did very well. They kept control of the Senate and House and picked up more governorships. Which means that President Trump will have a solid governing coalition to deliver on his promises. Evan McMorris-Santoro has more on what to expect from the Trump agenda. Donald Trump is now the head of an incredibly powerful political party that is rapidly unifying behind him. The mechanics of how Trump is going to lead are still very vague. Republicans who opposed him are in the Senate, Democrats who despised him are in there too. And look, Trump needs Congress to vote on things. But he also just showed the political world he's the only guy with his finger on the pulse of the American electorate. That gives him a lot of power in legislative negotiations. Under President Trump, America's priorities will change. President Obama cast climate change as the number one national security threat to the United States. Hillary Clinton made addressing it one of her top priorities. Trump has denied climate change even exists and has promised a revitalization of the fossil fuel industry. The United States has the largest recoverable coal resources in the world. We're talking clean coal. No Republican in Congress voted for the Affordable Care Act, and the party's been trying to repeal it since it became law. Democrats still have the power to block a full repeal of Obama's signature health care law, but reforming it is now a quaint old-fashioned notion. We're going to repeal it, and we're going to replace it, and we're going to get you great, great health care at a fraction of the cost. It was political orthodoxy until last night that if you wanted to win a nationwide race in America, you had to be a supporter of immigration reform. Not anymore. We're going to build the wall and Mexico is going to pay for the wall. Believe me, 100%. Libertarian-leaning Republicans and social justice-minded Democrats spent a lot of the year trying to find common ground on criminal justice reform. Hopes for legislation were eventually dashed by a group of law and order conservatives. Trump is from that school of thought. Violent crime has risen 17%, and in America's 50 largest cities, it's only going one way, folks, and that's up. Decades of trade policy are over. Both Republican and Democratic base voters abhorred free trade deals in 2016, and Trump's rise was in part fueled by his attacks on existing deals like NAFTA and dismissal of proposals like TPP, which until a couple of hours ago, the Obama White House was still trying to get passed before the end of the year. We will renegotiate our horrible trade deals to bring back jobs and opportunity. It's not exactly clear what Trump will achieve, but it's apparent a number of top liberal priorities are already kaput for the time being. There's a famous saying in politics that you win elections with addition, not subtraction. And Tuesday night's surprise result only proved it once again. Clinton lost because her coalition didn't turn out in sufficient numbers in the states that mattered, even though she won the popular vote by a hair. Of 231.5 million eligible voters this year, only 128.8 million actually voted. 
That's about 1.5 million fewer voters than there were in 2012, and a decline for the second election in a row. The voter turnout rate in the U.S. is one of the lowest in the developed world, and it dipped further this year. 46.9% of the population did not vote, and of the 55.6% of people that did vote, 25.5% voted for Trump and 25.6% voted for Clinton. That turnout decline came as a shock to Dr. Michael McDonald, a political scientist at the University of Florida, after the record numbers of early voters in this election. But there is a logic to it. People who were actively engaged in following the election were the ones that were voting, but uh, much of the rest of the country was disengaged. And uh, so the early vote numbers gave us a false signal as to what was happening with the electorate. So who didn't show up to vote? McDonald says that in places where turnout went down, it was Democrats who had withdrawn from the electorate. In heavily Democratic Detroit, Clinton received about 78,000 fewer votes than Obama did in 2012, and lost Michigan by around 12,000 votes. Young voters supported Hillary Clinton over Donald Trump 55% to 37%, but Clinton's youth support still fell short of both of President Obama's campaigns. Exit polls also suggest Clinton underperformed among African-American and Latino voters. But take exit polls with caution, says McDonald. The exit polls are really meant to tell us why people voted. They're not really meant to tell us um, what the demographic profile of the electorate is. Exit polls might be able to tell us who did vote, but we still don't know much about those who didn't. Some of the dip in turnout can be chalked up to the usual cause, apathy. But not all of it. For some Americans, abstaining from the vote was a statement. Dexter Thomas spent election day with one Ohio voter who made a point of staying home. Good morning, Poopy. On election day, like a lot of people in America, Danielle Anderson got up and got ready for the day. And like a lot of people in America, she didn't vote. I'm nervous to be telling the whole world that I'm not voting today, because it's a really big deal. Like, people hearing, like, you're not voting, it's going to anger people. And what do you think that is? Because it should. People who are voting, they're not voting because they like a candidate. They're voting because they're scared, because this is their family on the line, this is their livelihood, this is their well-being. So I get that. Danielle is 22 years old and mom to one-year-old Cooper. She, Cooper, and Cooper's dad live in Middletown, Ohio. She voted for President Obama four years ago, and this year she was a Bernie Sanders supporter. I decided not to vote because I think this whole election sheds light on everything that's wrong with our systems. There isn't a red or a blue candidate that I that I could ever stand behind, or even if I voted because the other person was just so bad, I wouldn't feel like if that person won, I would have won something. Whether or not you actually vote, the government will affect you somehow. Yeah. Are you prepared to deal with those consequences, whatever those might be? Yeah. So I have really looked into what worst case scenario could be. There's like a lot of really touchy things, especially for me as a new parent on the ballot. And so I think about, you know, the possibility that Obamacare would be overturned, which is something that I have. Because of that, like, I didn't have to worry about how I was going to afford my epidural or how I was going to afford to hold my baby. I think about how bad it would be if Obamacare got overturned and I had to figure out a plan B, and I could do it. I think that my statement is more important than if I lose that. When they announce the winner tonight, when they say, this is it, this is the person, I'm going to be at peace with my decision not to have gone. Thank you very much, everyone. So how are you feeling this morning? Do you regret not voting at all? I don't, because I think what I thought was going to happen is going to happen. Everyone's freaking out. Part of me feels like maybe I should be scared because there's a lot at stake for a lot of other people. But I don't think things would have changed if Hillary Clinton would have won. I think things are going to change. So 
I guess in a way though, you are kind of saying, we just Probably. need to burn everything down and start over again. Yeah, Probably. yeah. So we burned everything down. What better way to get people to change the country than by making them, by giving them no other choice. By saying, hey, you're gonna have this crazy lunatic for four years or you're gonna do something about it. If things are worst case scenario for four years, but the outcome is a lifetime of a better country, then four years is a blink of an eye. And I don't, I don't regret not voting. Financial markets tumbled overnight as Donald Trump moved closer to claiming the presidency. But by the time trading closed this afternoon, the Dow Jones was up more than 250 points. As Roberto Ferdman explains, that probably isn't the end of the story. Volatility. We're going to see a lot of this going forward. As everyone tries to figure out what a Trump presidency means for the U.S. and global economy, markets are going to be a little all over the place. We saw this last night when the price of gold and Bitcoin jumped because, at least for a moment, investors thought it was safer to own borderless currencies than actual American dollars. What's scary about that is the dollar has been the world's safe haven for decades. Every foreign investor and government fetishizes it. And that leads to an important question. If even the safest haven isn't safe anymore, what should people do with their money? Unfortunately, there isn't a great answer right now. In uncertain times, one simple thing to do is save more cash. That was true even before Trump. Super low investment returns and longer lifespans mean we all need to have more savings. The uncertainty surrounding an upcoming Trump administration only makes that more true. But if everyone sits on their money, spending and investing slows. Then companies start to cut costs, jobs go away, and it becomes harder for everyone to earn a decent paycheck. Hoarding is one of the reasons the recessions start. The solution for any one person right now isn't the solution for the economy as a whole. And until we have a better sense of how Trump is going to behave as president, that probably isn't going to change. Hillary Clinton hoped to break what she often calls the highest glass ceiling. She fell short. In her concession speech on Wednesday, she expressed hope that someone else might do it soon. But history suggests that it might be a long time coming. Where one woman paves the way, voters usually aren't quick to elect another. Jeanette Rankin of Montana, the first female representative in Congress, was elected in 1917. But Montana didn't elect a woman to the House again until 1941, and it was Rankin, back for an encore. Rebecca Latimer Felton of Georgia was America's first female senator. She was appointed in 1922 after the sitting senator died in office. She served for just 24 hours while the Senate was in session. Nine years later, Hattie Carraway of Arkansas became the first woman elected to the Senate in her own right. But 60 more years passed before Arkansas elected its next female senator in 1999. In total, there have been 256 women representatives, 46 senators, and just 38 governors. Five states still haven't elected a female representative, 21 have never elected a female senator, and 23 have never elected a female governor. But female candidates did make progress in this election. A record number of women ran for office, and 89 of them won races across the country. America now has its first Latina senator, its second black female senator, and its first openly LGBT governor. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, November 9th.